Did you mention what? The monks and nuns who are committing suicide. Oh, the monks who are committing suicide. Yeah, right. Oh, they're not, well, um, not only monks, also lay people, old and young. Very upsetting to me and Dalai Lama. And he said it when it first started, he said, oh, that's terrible. It won't be effective <laughs> as well. And, uh, and then the Chinese are trying to act like somehow Dalai Lama is making them do it, which is absolutely the opposite of the case. And um, so it's a tricky thing. He, he can't really make a big statement. He said that uh, he doesn't approve of it as a policy. And if anybody asked him, who said, you know, I'm going to go out and burn myself today as, a, as an offering to the Buddhas, and in order to sort of call attention to the Tibetan plight and so on, <coughs> uh, he would say, absolutely not. You should be offering every day for your long human life your ignorance and your greed and your hatred and many things, and you to the Buddhas, and you should be working using your human intelligence to become a Buddha. And if your Chinese are making you suffer, you should be using that suffering to develop yourself and so forth. And by no means should you cut your body short, your life short like this, and do this to yourself. And it is not effective, even helping or calling attention is not going to have any effect. So, but, if they asked him ahead of time. But then afterwards, they are kind of heroes in the Buddhist sense, and he doesn't feel he should condemn them. So he's kind of stuck there, you know. He, at least he does respond to the Chinese. He says, please come. You can go through all my emails. You can go through everything in every office here, and there's nobody encouraging them to do this. Uh, this is something that may have started, they may have recently, well, no, that guy, there was a guy in Dharamsala who was a cook. He had been a monk. He then uh, was in the Indian military, in the Tibetan Defense Force that, that um, tried to help poor Nehru when China invaded Arunachal Pradesh, the northeast frontier area, in 1962. And the Indians couldn't struggle with them at that altitude. They hadn't trained up there. And then the Tibetans formed a brigade to try to defend India, their sort of new mother country. And he had served in that. And then he was actually was working as a cook in Dharamsala after having gotten out of Indian military service. And he was down in Delhi with some people who were doing a fast unto death, they were saying, to protest you know, the visit of Hu Jintao or Jiang Zemin. I, don't remember, I think Jiang Zemin and in, in India. And then the Indians dragged them away and hooked them up, IV'd them, you know, to, so they wouldn't die. And then while they were dragging them away, this one guy who had joined that fast, he lit himself on fire. And this was 1997, so it was Jiang Zemin's time. And Dalai Lama was really upset about it, and he went to the, all the way, the, the, he was coming to America, actually, so I saw him right after that. And he came to Delhi, and he went to the hospital where the guy was all like a mummy, all bandaged up. Not quite dead yet, but he did die. And uh, the Dalai Lama whispered into his ear, OK, you, know, you made this statement. I wish you hadn't, but you did. That's your statement. And, but please, do not die with hatred of the Chinese in your heart. That would be really, really terrible. And it would be against everything. And so do not do that. You've done this, and you may die, and you know, you think of it, I guess you can think of it as an offering to awaken people to the nature of suffering. Uh, but you're trying to awaken the Chinese just as much as anybody else, and do not die with any tiny scrap of hatred of the Chinese people in your heart. And the guy, the guy you know, he said there was a perceptible sort of nodding from within, you know, of the mummy, the bandaged mummy there. I saw a photograph. And then he was very, very upset about it, the Dalai Lama. And he was in America. And uh, I saw him at the premiere of Kundun shortly after that. And he was, he was really upset about it because he was saying that the kind of energy, the kind of emotional pitch that people would get to have to do that uh, is similar to a suicide bomber. And he thought if someone... If the Tibetans are doing that now, maybe they'll 
do suicide bombing, then that will give the excuse for Chinese to be even more genocidal. And it would be terrible, it would be totally against his uh, thing. And he never made that as a public statement, thank goodness, because you never know, Chinese might have done an agent provocateur or suicide bombing to blame the Tibetans. And they might have arranged something. And um, so then, but then we come back to the current 150 people so far who have done this. And um, I defend them, actually. Um, some people attack me on the internet for doing so, but I do defend them. But similarly, I like His Holiness, I can totally agree. If anybody told me, don't do that. Actually, I even, I confess, I lied in Lhasa once in the 90s, or I think in the, maybe the noughts, aughts, whatever you call that decade. And I met some nuns, some activist nuns in Tibet, and who go, go and they pray long live Dalai Lama, and they wave the flag, and then they get tortured and busted and kicked out of the nunnery if they survive because they put in a Chinese camp for doing that. You know? But they just do it because they just feel overwhelmed and compelled to do it. So I actually lied and I said, His Holiness told me if I met any of you not to do that, to stay in your monastery and study and things will someday improve and then your study will be, you will be a great person and you'll be able to do something and don't waste your life on that. You know, it's not helping anybody and it's just ruining your study and your life and don't let your emotions carry you away like that. And I actually lied. He hadn't told me that. He didn't know I was going to Tibet at that time. But he would agree with me. I actually confessed to him. And he was glad I did. He said, good. He, he praised me for lying. <laughs> and my accent in Tibetan, when I speak Tibetan, is like his. And they get all emotional around me, Tibetans. So I have to be very careful in Tibet because they're being watched all the time, you know, by surveilled all the time. You know. Now, coming back to the current group, um, Basically, I think his only was correct in that original worry he had, that they are people who have become so distressed at the Chinese interference in their culture, the Chinese torture of different great teachers and lamas, and the whole scene that they are doing, which is very, very harsh in Tibet, you have to understand. They are being treated extremely harshly, and it accelerated enormously since 2008 when there was a mainly nonviolent, basically, rebellion in Tibet, where they did things like they tore down the Chinese flag, they put up the Tibetan flag. In Lhasa, there was some violence, but I believe that, I personally believe that was staged, because that is something they had, that Hu Jintao did when he was the party boss in Tibet in the late 80s and declared martial law. He stayed, you know, what they do is they dress up some, some Chinese uh, people or Tibetan agents that they have in their own secret police as monks. And then they have them go out and do some beating or burning or something. And then, they, then there's a mob gathers around them. And then they shoot the mob and stuff. They, the thing they have done before. And so I believe that one because who the party boss in Tibet at the beginning of that whole nationwide thing, uh, like something like 215 demonstrations all over Tibet, including areas that are technically outside of the Tibet Autonomous Region, but actually are Tibet, where two-thirds of the Tibetans live in the eastern, the four Tibet Autonomous Prefectures of, of four, eastern, four western provinces of China and eastern parts of Tibet, which they divided off and act like it isn't Tibet, but actually it is Tibet. And, um, you know, Kham and Amdo is what the Tibetans call it. So in those, there were all these protests in those regions. But the only violence that people can point to other than Chinese shooting into crowds were the ones in Lhasa. And that Jiang Jingli, who was the party boss at that time, the, the fall before in 2007, when Dalai Lama was given the gold medal in the Congress here in the US, that Jiang Jingli said on CNN, he said, I will show you that the Dalai Lama is an evil wolf and a bad person and no good and blah, blah. And the Tibetans are not nice and you think they're great and you are people in the world and you're all wrong and they're evil and bad and blah, blah, blah. He made a big thing how he was going to do something. And that's what he did. He staged the thing where it made, he tried to make Tibetans look like they were beating up some people and things like that. And, uh, and that was played, it was more for the Chinese market. It was played endlessly in the Chinese media to make the Chinese feel oh, we've done so much for Tibet, and now they're beating us up and burning our shops, and et cetera, et cetera. You know? And the proof that I have is only that A, they've done it before, and B, 
the Tibetans were pretending to look like Kambas, who are these very tough people in eastern Tibet. But they were doing it in front of cameras. The Kambas, in, if you go in Lhasa now, there's surveillance cameras on every roof of low buildings. You can go up on the stairs of those low buildings, and you can break those cameras if you're going to do something like that. If Tibetans want to actually have a fight and a revolution, and Kambas are well capable of it, they're not going to do it in front of cameras. I wouldn't, would you? Because then they identify you, and they have you know, software they get from Silicon Valley, you know, sold by us, facial recognition software. They're going to find you and beat you up and your family and torture you and kill you, and you'll be executed. So that would, they definitely were not doing that, really doing that. Anyway, that's what sparked this off. And basically then, the people who burned themselves, they are considering that they are making an offering of their body and showing their freedom, actually, because they feel they are caught under genocidal oppression. And somehow, when somebody is coming to kill you, you say, you can't kill me because I'm going to do myself in as a voluntary choice. And I'm going to give my body as, as a prayer that you know, this situation of mutual oppression and mutual you know, master-slave situation that's going on here is not a proper thing for human beings to do. You are not proper being master. I am not proper being a slave. I assert my freedom. I'm going to give up my life. Because actually, the physical life is not the main thing in life. You know, the physical body. You materialist, Marxist, dialectical materialist, Chinese soldiers and secret police, etc. So it's a very powerful statement, actually. And, it has, it, and the Chinese know that. And their biggest fear, the, the dominators, is not to let this be seen in China. Because actually, in the Buddhist tradition, the, the, the ritual of offering your body in flames is very much more prevalent in Chinese Buddhism, Vietnamese Buddhism, not in Tibetan Buddhism. Because those cultures don't have tantra, where you consider the body to be this sacred temple that if you learn to use the human body, you can accelerate evolution enormously, and therefore you should never damage your body. There's a big thing about that. Not that you, know, you won't be reborn. They don't consider it suicide because they're not killing their self. Their self is going to be reborn. And basically, on a, out of giving your body, you'll be reborn better in a better body. And maybe you'll be in California instead of Eastern Tibet being beaten up by some Chinese people's armed police. Or you might be born as a Chinese person, and you might be telling the people's arm, daughter of a member of the people's armed police, and when that guy goes home on vacation, you might say, Daddy, why are you beating up the Tibetans? And who's telling you to do that? And what is the point of that, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so that's the thing. And, and therefore, I consider them kind of following the Dalai Lama's injunction against violence and his insistence that Tibetan freedom will be won by nonviolence, which will be the first in history that an international, you know, international struggle will be, have been won by nonviolence. You know, Gandhi, in some sense, won freedom from the British by nonviolence, but that was within this one country. And also, it was a huge majority of Indian people against the minority of British uh, colonial power. Uh, but but no one ever tried it you know, in, uh, in an international thing. And a small 6 million Tibetans and 130 million, I mean, 1.3 billion Chinese. It's never been done. But, but Dalai Lama has insisted on doing that. And so these are people who are at a point where, of course, they would have absolutely sacrificed their life and body like any soldier does, real soldier. You know, they charge machine gun nests and so forth, you know, Sergeant York or whatever, what have you, you know. That's what sold to Iwo Jima, you know, like they charge the, they charge the enemy and they're ready to give their life, you know. And uh, they're at that point where they would have attacked and blown up a police station or done something. Tibetans are very capable of, mech, you know, they're, they're very fierce. They, where they, when they did fight the Chinese in eastern Tibet uh, in the 50s, they, were, they took a, exacted a huge price from much better armed Chinese soldiers. But they were eventually, of course, defeated in numbers and also armament. They were poorly armed. And the Dalai Lama also told them not to do it. So they were not actually sort of licensed or legitimized in doing that. But they just did it to defend themselves. 
So, uh, so they are doing what they are at that point of heroism where they could actually, in a normal setting, harm somebody else. But they are not harming anybody else. And they are making this, they're, they're changing the level of the game, actually. And so they are kind of like the heroes of the war of nonviolence, in a way. And of course, I think some of them, unfortunately, were not, were not necessarily yet at a level where they really don't have anger or hatred in their mind. I think maybe some of the monks do, are at that level. But I think some of the lay people, especially the young ones, I don't think they're necessarily at that level. And so, unfortunately, it's kind of a, it's a mixed bag for them. It's not as, it's not as perfectly done as, as otherwise. But I don't know if you remember, you do, because you're my age-ish, so you remember the monk in Vietnam who, who gave his body you know, and walked up smiling and talking and then sat down. And I don't know if you ever saw the full film where he smiles even with the flames blazing. He's still smiling. And he, and he walked and talked just before, so he was not doped up. And, he's, and then his body just goes poof like that. And that had such a powerful impact in relation to the, our population and the sense of the, Viet, the injustice of the Vietnam War. So therefore, the Chinese, they shut down all cell phone things. They go out and confiscate people's phones. And they're desperate not to have that spread in China, especially. And even abroad, but especially in China. They don't want the young people in China to see that because it's such a powerful challenge to their fake thing that they are helping the Tibetans, where the Tibetans do that in the, in the hundreds. And the Tibetans say funny things like, one guy in Tunisia, like a fruit seller, he burned himself because he didn't get his like, you know, like sidewalk license to sell his fruit. And then there's the whole Arab Spring. And we're 150 and counting, and nobody's doing anything. And the British are out there, oh, please come and open a bank in London. You know, they're like behaving like that, the Queen of England.